Why is the Type 21 fascinating? The fascination with the Type 21 is commonly rooted in the innovation leap the submarine represents. It was not only the first wheel submarine design where submerged travel was prioritized over surface travel, but the design was also innovative in how torpedoes were reloaded, auto depth keeping, and several hull changes to reduce drag. In short, it was an entirely different design compared to the designs of World War I and the existing World War II designs. This is also why most of the post-World War II submarine designs around the world took inspiration from the Type 21. Traces of the Type 21 can be found in the US Guppy program, British submarine classes, French submarine classes, several Soviet classes and of course many later German designs to name a few. However, to better understand the success of the Type 21 during World War II, we need to focus our attention on that point in time. During World War II, in order to correctly calculate a firing solution for the torpedoes, a submarine generally needed to obtain several visual contacts with the target to accurately estimate the target speed and course. This all had to be done at the surface or near the surface using a periscope putting the submarine at risk of detection. The submerged capabilities of the submarines prior to the Type 21 were limited due to the submarine's submerged speed, battery capacity. In fact, the destroyers protecting convoys did not have to sink the submarines. They just had to suppress them, so the submarines would stay submerged long enough for the convoy to pass. This would negate the submarine's ability to calculate the right speed and trajectory for the torpedoes. The reason it was an effective threat mitigation tactic was because a submerged submarine could not outrun a convoy, let alone a destroyer for that matter. The average speed of a convoy was 9.5 knots and the submerged speed of a Type 7 was approximately 7 knots. The submarine's submerged speed was too limited and battery capacity was too low to allow other options than evasive maneuvers. Sure, the submarine could surface once a convoy had moved on and use its high surface speed to overtake the convoy, but it would then become a subject of the hunt again and would probably be forced to submerge again. In the winter of 1943 to 1944, the Allied Intelligence Services saw the first indications of a new submarine, which led to the discovery of the Type 21 in the spring of 1944. Intelligence reports showed that the expected performance of the Type 21 would render the existing tactic to keep the submarine submerged ineffective, and the submarine would become a significant threat. This information raised concerns among the Allies. Furthermore, the diving depth of the Type 21 put the submarine beyond the maximum depth of the depth charges. This, paired with the significant reduced noise generation of the electric motors, meant that the expectation was that no Allied technology would be able to find the Type 21 or destroy it. To test this expectation, the British performed the fast submarine ASTIC trials in late September 1944. The test showed that a destroyer traveling above 16 knots would experience severe reduction in ASTIC detection range. This mattered because the Type 21 was expected to travel as fast as 17 knots submerged. Even with two highly experienced destroyer crews hunting in a group, the expected high speed of the Type 21 would be a real challenge. The conclusion of the fast submarine trial stated, the Type 21 U-boat's higher expected speed of sub-15 to 17 knots might just be enough to tip the tactical scale in favor of the submarine and perhaps make countering the Type 21 an insurmountable problem. These were the technical specifications for the Type 21's power plant and charging time. The expected result of this setup was a significant increase in submerged speed compared to the Type 7. 
the key information to note is the 17.2 knots and for 90 minutes. Such new capabilities played very well into the German requirements to support the strategy to succeed in the Battle of the Atlantic. In Dönitz's own words, only a U-boat which no longer needed to service in order to recharge batteries and which had both high speed and long endurance underwater could improve our prospects in the battle ahead. Our sole consolation was that such a boat already existed and that each hour brought us nearer to the day when it would enter the fight. Dönitz saw it as a winning formula and a true challenge for the Allies. But bear in mind that these were only the design specification and they were not yet tested in real world conditions. The Military Historical Society of Australia has done extensive research into the actual historic performance of the Type 21. They did this by examining the basis of what was the confirmation of what the design could achieve. The results are rather interesting. The centerpiece of the confirmation of the performance more or less comes down to one patrol and the alleged experience reported by the captain of U-2511. The proof to this claim has become when and where he encountered the HMS Norfolk combined with when he subsequently arrived at Bergen. However, the testimony has later been analyzed by Dr. Niesle in 1988 who concluded that what the captain of the U-2511 experienced could not have happened. The logs of the U-2511 were incorrect and the HMS Norfolk was not where the U-boat claimed to have seen it. Dr. Niesle's analysis was later reviewed by the Military Historical Society of Australia and no flaws was found and it stands uncontested till this day. Records also show that the captain had a history of falsely reported combat achievements, making up almost 50% of his file, which leads to the questioning of his reliability as a witness. If we consider other reports of the Type 21's performance during World War II and combine the numbers with the results of the British and US tests of the Type 21 after World War II, the numbers we'll see will be sobering. This shows a significant difference in the power plant output, but also in the charging time. However, the most significant change was on the speed. This data undermines the evidence of the tactical advantage that the Type 21 was supposed to have and of its competitive capabilities. More specifically in terms of its underwater speed and the endurance at this speed. Let's unpack this a little more, keeping in mind that the Type 21 was designed for a greater submerged speed, or in other words, the submarine was rather slow on the surface. The German Navy even concluded the average submerged speed of the Type 21 would have been 4.6 knots, making it useless to even shadow a slow convoy. Surfacing the submarine to overtake the convoy would not have increased the chances as the surface speed would be a maximum of 12 knots and the convoys would often travel at 9.5 knots. Even though the Type 21 was faster than a convoy, the margins would be too small for this to be an effective tactic. Making things worse, the acoustic signature of the Type 21 was much greater than the Type 7, so destroyers using Aztec would more easily find a Type 21. Of course, this might not have been a problem in itself if the other specifications had been met, where the submarine would have been able to evade using high submerged speed. It's not only the studies of Dr. Niesle or the Military Historical Society of Australia which comes to these conclusions. They are laid out by U-boat ace Erik Topp, who wrote the 1944 battle instructions for the Type 21. The boats did by no means live up to the boats that Dönitz had made to Hitler and us U-boat officers. 
Compared to the older Type 7C boats, the Type 21 version undoubtedly represented progress and innovation, but it could never by itself have turned the tide of the war at sea, let alone the overall conflict. Was the Type 21 a success? In so many words, no. Reviewing the actual performance of the Type 21 during World War II, it shows that in many ways it performed worse than the Type 7 in a scenario where it needed to attack a convoy. It was also so slow on the surface that it could not effectively overtake a convoy, and it represented a much larger target for Aztec. While what I have presented here might be sobering in the context of the idea of the Type 21, it does not take away from the fact that the Type 21's design fundamentally impacted the post-World War II submarine designs around the world. It still stands as the first real war submarine in production, and its legacy is renowned. And maybe with additional time and experience during World War II, the submarine's issues would have been resolved by later design updates. And on that note, I would like to ask you if you found this video informative. If so, please help me uh, leave a like or even a comment. I only produce about one piece of content per year, so also consider subscribing to get a notification of my next video. Or you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram for updates on pre-production and other events.